And welcome to the Daily Space Weather Show. We've got a late arriving coronal mass ejection. I think it's showing up right now. Lots of solar filaments. At least one new sunspot has formed. We'll cover it and lots more, including perspective. Here at the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. This is the past 24 hours from SDO. This video features ionized helium and ionized iron, 304 angstroms plus 335 angstroms, respectively. And let's talk about perspective. So many times we look at features and we say, hey, look, there's a small filament, right? So you can see this large filament here just to the east of the Earth's scale there. This dark absorption feature right here, that's a huge plasma filament there as it's suspended by magnetic fields defying gravity. Let's take a look at this quote small and quote crown prominence. When we say small, features on the Sun that are small tend to be larger than the entire planet Earth, as you can see there. So at a, at a time of extreme low solar activity, it's a good time to look at some features up close. There's the equatorial view again. We've got quite a few filaments. We have a coronal hole that's opened up of South Pole orientation down there in the southeastern quadrant. The most activity right now is in the northern hemisphere. So it's where a new sunspot grew. You might see one growing right here. That is indeed a sunspot. We've also got some prominences up there. For example, this one up here in the northeast. So there's a great example of a quote small and quote solar feature. That prominence is well, hundreds of thousands of kilometers in length. It looks like it stretches all the way around the northeastern limb to the far side. And you might see a quote and quote small prominence over here as well. We put the Earth scale right next to that just to give you an idea of the size of a small solar feature. So we've got lots more solar imagery for you here coming up. First, take a moment to press the like button. If you haven't done so yet, please do so, as this video cannot continue until you've pressed like. So we're, we're, waiting, we're waiting to see the likes light up, but until then, I'll just have to wait. Mmm, mmm, droopy dog must wait till the likes light up. So press like, and then we'll continue with the video. Okay. Is that okay? Have you pressed like yet? Hmm. Hmm. Why don't you leave a comment about how you're mad that you'd like us to stop telling people to press like. Give us all kinds of advice. Whether wanted or not, we, we do appreciate that. So make sure you leave us advice and make sure on Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern time that you tune into our live interactive conversation. It'll actually be hosted by Eugene the Philosopher. So if you haven't subscribed to Eugene the Philosopher yet, that's another project for you. But at the moment, press like, subscribe, share, etc. Press all the things or we will find you. And lest thy soul be cast into an ever-deepening and darkening abyss of doo-doo, diarrhea, and cat urine. Make sure you press like. Otherwise, the ramifications could be dire for your soul. By the way, we are the most comprehensive daily space weather content in the known universe. We put out more detailed imagery of the sun 
meteorology segments that empower our viewers to forecast their own weather. Can you forecast your own weather all the way from the sun down to the earth? I came from the realm of cosmology. I'm back. And in science, we often end up with answers to questions not asked. That's what happened to me. I didn't want to explain the solar sunspot cycles. I just realized the likely plausible mechanism that underlies them. And so, the world's most comprehensive daily space weather content. <clears throat> so, there's that. The following are paid promotions. Please support smashomash.com. In 2018, a crack YouTube unit was sent to social media prison for a crime we did not commit. We promptly escaped a maximum security social media stockade to the internet underground where we survive as producers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find the content, maybe you can hire the Smash Team. No, you certainly can. You can certainly visit a website as you're viewing this video on this amazing, amazing institution known as the internet, which is, by the way, stronger than any single fascist entity in the universe. The internet. It can destroy you, but you can't destroy it. So join us over there at the Smash Team if you want additional content, especially at the gold level. There's also a silver level and a bronze level. The bronze level even gets alerts about videos just like this one. Yeah, we put out email alerts for videos just like this one because people aren't seeing the content in their subscription feed even though they've subscribed. So there's that. <clears throat> Here's some more paid endorsements. Have you gotten yourself a set of Eclipse glasses? This is a high quality set here. It, it also includes three sets of paper glasses. So if you and three friends want to view the 2024 total solar eclipse, which will be visible across large portions of the United States, perhaps pick up this high quality set, part of our Spaceware collection. Yeah, the Spaceware collection, where you can find all kinds of other Spaceware, whether it's of course, you want to wear Hawaiian shirts when you're on a space voyage. And, uh, yeah, space wear collection. It includes various different iterations of Eclipse glasses. Are you able to go out and look directly at the sun? <clears throat> if not, head to Amazon.com slash shop slash Smashomash, which is also linked conveniently below this video, and pick up some items from our Amazon shop. Help support the channel that way, perhaps. Here's another paid endorsement. This is the Hemp Lucid Shop, which features CBD tinctures, mushroom gummies, other types of immune stress and sleep stacks, which you can save quite big on. 15 bucks savings there on individual ones and even more savings on the full stack. Body balms, lip balms, CBD for your pets. The Hemp Lucid link also featured below this video and on the homepage at smashomash.com. So if you're in the market for those items, help out the channel that way as we strive to create a sustainable operation. Smashomash.com slash smash team is the official subscription services site of the Smash News Network least busted name and news. It is our quote paywall, end quote. Again, we do give out additional content for our gold and silver Smash Team members, especially even bronze level members do get some additional content. So perhaps support the channel that way. The best value is the gold annual paid up subscription. It's almost like getting four months of a free gold membership as it includes complimentary merch. The Smash Team site also linked below this video and on the homepage at smashomash.com. Today's featured product from the merch shop. Another paid endorsement is do not pull vault to Caldera. If you're going on a volcanic vacation, folks, leave your vault pull at home. And if you're going through hell, keep going. That's a quote from Winston Tur Churchill for you. And by the way, our finest days lie ahead. I know times might seem pretty bad right now. I would tend to agree with you. There's certainly lots of evidence that times are less than optimal for various reasons. However, this too shall pass. So don't pull vault the caldera. It could be unhealthful. Don't be like Steve Stimpak, who later died in a tragic table tennis accident. But that story is for another time. In the meantime, don't pull vault the caldera. Do visit the links below the video 
They are an effort to keep this channel in existence, publicly visible, and free for all to view. We don't want to put the content behind a paywall, so help us create a sustainable operation. And in the meantime, don't pull vault the caldera. So here's this new sunspot forming right up here. It's already a beta class sunspot right there. And there might be some new groups also forming here closer to the equator, just moving into center disk right now. So several small pores there looking like they might remain intact long enough to be named. As the sunspot number has dipped below 50, it'll come back up pretty promptly here in the coming days. There's a magnetogram, and like the SDO continuum we just showed you, that depicts yesterday, October 19th, and today, October 20th, to date. So that's what's going on. Let's take a look at volcanoes, as we've got one on the list that hasn't been there before, starting with Bezzy Miani. Not sure if that one's erupting. Volcanic ash not identifiable in satellite imagery. Mount Mayan producing an unknown volcanic ash plume over Luzon Island, Philippines. And Slamet. Slamet is showing possibilities of a phreatic explosion where water interacts with rocks causing fracturing and explosions. So there's ground uplift being detected there on the Isle of Central Java, Indonesia. Slamet could be fixing to erupt. So there's there's a one that might show up on the list in the future. Luatolo is producing an explosive 7,000-foot ash plume. Flight level 070. Flight level 140 over Semeru, also on the Isle of East Java, as it explodes. It's a 14,000-foot ash plume. Popocatépetl headed down to North, North America here. Central Mexico featuring a 23,000-foot ash plume there. As Popocatépetl explodes, it's a flight level 230. Flight level 150 over Guatemala from Fuego. Flight level 220 over Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia. 22,000 foot ash plume there. 14,000 foot ash plume over Revenador in Ecuador as it explodes. And continuous emissions also from Sabancaya. Next is earthquakes. There are the past 90 days from VolcanoDiscovery.com. And no major quakes over the past 24 hours will cite quakes of a 5 or greater magnitude. Starting with this 5.2 at Indonesia. That was at 1408 Universal Time yesterday afternoon. Largest quake of the past 24, I believe, was this 5.9 at Philippines. Looks like it did some damage, too. That was at 1858 Universal Time yesterday evening. There's also a 5.8 there near Guam. That was just after midnight at 0 dark 04 this morning. And that is all that's been shaken as far as what's been earthquaking. Next, another 24 hour video. Here we put together. 1700 angstroms plus 171 angstroms from SDO. And let's talk stats. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux now all the way down to 134 solar flux units. And that is the lowest levels we've seen since February. Right there. The last time we've been down to that level is mid. No, wait. No, that's December. December of 2022. Yep. December of last year is the last time we saw radio flux levels. Oh, it's, it's actually below 130 here. It's actually at 129. There you go. 129 is the current 10.7 centimeter radio flux depicted by this black line over the past year. 
Look at the sunspot number there, dipping down. Looks like it's below 40 here at the moment, according to Solon.info. Again, we have the uh, coronal mass ejection is, is a little bit late. I think it's actually arriving right now. So we may see us jump into geomagnetic storm conditions here in the coming hours. Fingers crossed. And uh, it looks like it was moving a little bit more slowly than anybody anticipated. So there is the Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard, and you can see they were NOAA was expecting a peak in that CME impact a few hours ago there, around between 3 and 6 universal time this morning. It's not here yet. So we'll be keeping an eye on it. And when I say eye on, pardon the pun. Here are the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space, and I think you will see a little uptick in the magnetohydrodynamic pressure here at the end of this four-hour video. It looks like there may be some higher density and higher speed plasma. Also a change in the magnetic field. So looks like a little uptick there over the past couple of hours. Here are the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. The geospace ground magnetic perturbations map does show magnetic flux density. And it is pretty good at showing you where the aurora are, more, are likely to be seen. So I've used it. Geospace Magnetosphere Movie Ground Magnetic Perturbations Map. So KP is only 2.33 here at the moment. The Planetary K Index is an average of global geomagnetism. For all you new viewers out there, if you haven't pressed subscribe, that's okay. Don't subscribe. It's that's on you. That's don't sign up for email alerts. Don't see the daily space weather content in your subscription feed, and don't know what's going on in space. That's on you. Check it out. The magnetic fields are increasing, and we're. I think we're going to chart. Chart. We're going to chart. Just kidding. I'm not going to chart. That was just a. That was a slip of the tongue, not a Freudian slip. We're going to start showing the ACE and Discover spacecraft. So you can see a magnetic field increase there at the ACE. Also, an increase in the solar wind velocity and density there over the past hour or so. So that's the ACE, the Discover. Also showing a recent uptick there in the magnetic field, which is the top line, the BZ now up to seven. Density much higher there at the Discover than at the ACE. Discover showing 14, pro, uh, okay, 12 and a half protons per cubic centimeter and a similar solar wind speed. So this looks like the CME arrival here. It's looking pretty weak so far. Fingers crossed for something more extreme. But at the moment, it's looking pretty mild. So no major change in the magnetic fields. No major density or velocity increase. Even the plasma temperature, this bottom line, is looking pretty mild. GOES magnetometers here showing some minor perturbations there. And the GOES satellites are located in a geosynchronous orbit at about way up there, at about 23,500 miles of altitude. That's the past three days. And it looks like the, the GOES 16 there, the red line, the GOES 16 had to do some very short maneuvering there to maintain its orbit which is what is depicted by this arc jet moment there. And next, look at the top, view ecliptic, the top view ecliptic plane field plot. And we see the South Pole current sheet here extending. So no transition to the North Pole current sheet yet. And it still might be a day or two. Because again, we do see a new South Pole coronal hole opening up in the Southeast. You can see the way right at the end of this video, you can see the South Pole current sheet headed farther out to the east, along with the North Pole current sheet, the sector boundary crossing there. So there is a there is a bit of magnetic, there's a magnetic tug of war going on in the eastern solar limb right now. So that's not really visible in most solar features, but the top view ecliptic plane field plot does show us this as the polarity of the plasma indicates what's going on there. 
Sunspots do affect this also. So if we are going to see sunspot growth or deterioration, you can expect to see growth in the northern hemisphere, the northeastern solar limb, or uh, degradation in the south. But I have a feeling it has to do with that coronal hole. There's a latest image. South Pole current sheet here has extended its reach to the east, and it, the North Pole current sheet might still not be here by tomorrow's daily space weather video. Next, our line of sight field plot. If you know, you know. And our regular viewers can probably tell you in the comments what that depicts. If you know what that depicts, let us know in the comments as we strive to empower our viewers to not only understand the physics, but be able to forecast space weather yourselves. We're taking this thing mainstream, folks, one way or another. Shout out to Tamitha Scove, space weather. It's about to become mainstream. Why? Because of the importance of private space flight, people like you will soon be able to go to space for less than six figures for like 10 minutes. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's better than it's been. Private space flight, it's, it's coming. It's coming to a vacation near you. So there is our line of sight coronal hole plot. Again, we did see this South Pole coronal hole kind of spontaneously open here. So that's pretty cool. Check it out. There's this South Pole coronal hole. And let's take a look at it from SDO. So right in here, this is a South Pole coronal hole right there. It kind of just formed. And that is a feature of this magnetic tug of war that's going on because there is some polaric indecision happening in the eastern limb right now. And that's super evident with that top view ecliptic plane field plot that we started out our gong data with. That's them's the facts and <laughs> let's get the sunspots so check out the sunspot number here oh my god it's dipping below 50 folks it's time to be very spooked and enter into the bunker pardon the sarcasm uh the sunspot number varies wildly in the middle of a solar cycle this is a known thing there is nothing scary about it in any way it's completely like i said normal and here's our flare scoreboard and probability monitor. So again, we do have a new sunspot here. This one will get a name today for sure. It, I think it's going to be called 3469, although I'm not sure because this one up here should have certainly been called 3469. See yesterday's video for, for more rants about that. But uh, there might be some more sunspots forming around this area here to the southeast of 3467 so we might see more than one new named group today i think there may be two new groups down here but this one certainly will get a name today i think it's going to be called 3469 but ultimately it's arbitrary and i don't really care about the numbers of the sunspots anyway it's all about the physics for me as i'm interested in heliophysics because of its effects on cosmology you might think that's dyslexia as I'm approaching this from the opposite side. The way the sun affects the, the way the the way the sun and the galaxy inter, the way the sun and the interstellar environment interact with each other. I'll I'll say that. That's the most accurate way to say it. So there's 171 angstroms plus SDO continuum. And yes, stars do interact with their interstellar environments. It's the only way to explain things like Novel explosions. Here's SDO continuum by itself. And again, you can see several pores in this area. So also down here. So there might be as, as many as three new sunspot groups there. there. There may be a group down here also. But this one up here is certainly going to get a name today. That one right there is already a beta class sunspot group. It might even be beta gamma class. We'll take a look at that toward the end of the video. And it looks like this one's actually still 
got sunspots there, so I, I don't know what's going on. It looks like sunspots are getting undernamed, as far as I can tell. I don't know. It's Maybe somebody's trying to make their forecast for a really weak solar cycle 25 look more accurate by... Whoops, I forgot to count some sunspots. My bad. I don't I don't know. It's it's a plausible explanation for why at least a half dozen sunspots have not been named throughout solar cycle 25 well documented on our channel. Next energetic particles and solar flares and it looks like we have a minor spike in the proton flux here. Not enough to cause any polar radio blackouts, but hey, if there is a CME arriving, that means there's a magnetic channel open between Earth and Sun, so we could see some proton events here in the coming, say, 12 to 16 hours. So just a minor little uptick there in the proton flux. We haven't seen any significant proton events here for a couple of weeks. As far as x-rays go, sun's been quiet. The background level has dropped all the way down to about a B5. So very low levels of activity here for the past week or so. Largest flare of the past 24 was this C2.2, barely even a blip on the radar there. That was at 4.50 universal time this morning. And let's take a look at flares from SDO's 131 plus 94 angstroms. Most of the activity has been in the western hemisphere. This latest C-class flare, I think, came from this group down here, actually. Uh, and we had several flares from be coming from behind the limb also. So some sunspots that aren't even visible anymore are still producing solar flares detectable from the mesosphere and up. Yes, you can't detect solar x-rays from the ground level. They don't make it to the ground level. They are adsorbed in the upper layers of Earth's atmosphere. So that's another 24-hour video from SDO. And it's time to cut to a star chart to let's orient ourselves, shall we? That's what's going on overhead Lehigh Valley, PA. There's where things are right now. And a fun fact about Orion. So when I open my front door in the morning, I can see Orion there right out the front door. And interesting fact about Orion, check this out. So Orion's belt, it forms a pretty straight line of three stars. If you pick the middle star and make a perpendicular line, it points right to Orion's shoulder there, which is the largest object visible, the largest single object visible from Earth, at least with the naked eye. It's Betelgeuse, the red supergiant star that is so huge that if it were centered where the sun is, you, as well as Mars would be inside of it. Largest object, largest single object visible to the naked eye there in the constellation Orion, the star Betelgeuse. Super easy to find, and it even looks red to the naked eye. Next, the solar system forecast. Besides you viewers, heavenly bodies, this is where the heavenly bodies of the solar system are located. Let's advance this one week. Here's where things will be in a week. As we approach the full moon, it'll be just a couple of days before Halloween there, it looks like. Full moon coming on maybe the 29th or so, so there should be a bright moon on Halloween Eve. But there's where things will be on the 27th. And let's take a look at the astronomy picture of the day. The astronomy photo of the day here, featuring some, some galaxies located tens of millions of light years away, are featured in this small section of sky. There's a great spiral galaxy, as well as an edge-on spiral galaxy. But that's not what this image is about at all. It's about this comet, which is coming. Its closest approach to Earth will be on November 10th, I think it said. Yeah, November 10th will be the closest approach to Earth by the comet seed slash 2023 H2 Lemon. And it, it's, uh, it's currently about seven light minutes away, so it's a similar distance from Earth as the sun at the moment. The sun about eight light minutes from Earth. 
So there you go. There's the astronomy photo of the day from apod.nasa.gov. Next, coronagraphs. And we'll start out by showing the Lasco C2 and C3. We did have some pretty sweet events. Also, Mercury making its way through the Lasco C2 there. Almost directly in line with the sun here, a little bit off to the north. So we've got the C2 a little bit ahead of the C3. We've got multiple coronal mass ejection events. Starting out with this one coming out of the southeast. You may think that one has an earthly directed component. However, the answer is that it doesn't. It appears that it is too far to the southeast to strike Earth. There it is showing up on the C3. And I'll bring this back briefly. So here's this CME from... It started to appear on the coronagraph around 1500 universal time yesterday. It is from the southeastern limb. And it looks like it is too far to the southeast to have an earthly directed component. That's my stance. I did some analysis and we'll show you that with some custom coronagraphs here in a minute. First, Stereo A located right there where that red circle is. And there it is on the coronagraph and the difference imagery. We'll briefly bring those back too as well, uh, just to uh, show you that. So there is that CME. Shows up great on the difference imagery. Again, that started to appear at about 1500 universal time yesterday. So there it is. And here comes some custom videos, another 24 hour video. That's SDL 193 angstroms along with Soho, Lasco C3 in blue and C2 in red. And as we zoom in a little bit closer, you'll be able to see the origin of that. It was a filamentary eruption from down here in the southeastern limb. It is on the Earth's side of the solar disk. It could have a tiny earthly directed component, but I suspect not. So that's my best guess. And leave us a comment if you've noted the accuracy of the forecasting over the past few years on the channel. The accuracy of the forecasting is one of the many reasons why there is absolutely no competition for daily space weather content. How do we do it? Well, it's a trade secret. Here we've added 193 angstroms. We've added 304 angstroms to the 193 angstroms SDO imagery, which should show that filamentary eruption even better. So it looks like it's well off to the east right here. You can also see a hydro flare happening right there. You can see some brightening of the lower corona there as that plasma succumbs to gravity, splashing back down toward the chromosphere, the transitional region between the photosphere, the solar surface, and the corona, the sun's atmosphere. There is the full disk view in those wavelengths from SDO. And let's move to filaments, since that's a great view of filaments right there. Here come filaments from the, this is the Udaipur, India, ground-based hydrogen alpha observatory. So some great definition there. Um, the Eric Weinstein filament right there. The Sonia Agora filament right there. And some of these could certainly use names like this one here and this one here. And if you want to name filaments, here's how it's done, folks. Here's how it's done. So like if you wanted to name this filament, 
first of all, let's bring up the latest image. So this filament here, it's right in the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk. You want to name it. Take a screeny of it. Head to x.com. Follow the hashtag name that filament. America's favorite pastime. Name that filament. Since filaments are lively, we name them after live humans. Who do you think we ought to name that filament after? Don't let us know in the comments. Let us know on Twitter because we will not name it if you try to name it in the YouTube comments. You have to have a Twitter account, and you really should type hashtag name that filament, somebody's name, a live human, and then at smash -o -mash so I know that you've commented. And then, ta-da! the filament will be named. It's like magic, folks. It's like magic with the magic of censorship at your fingertips. Next, the gray imagery to show prominences. And there are quite a few prominences here, as you can see. Yeah. Prominence, prominence, prominence. Prominence, prominence, and another prominence. And before we get the bonus features here, the past couple of hours from the Agos 16 SUVI. That's the past like two and a half hours or so. And let's blast through the bonus features. Satellite charging hazards. We got minor ones here, caused by low energy electrons building up on the outside of spacecraft here in the East Pacific, also over Mexico, moving toward the Central Pacific. Some minor satellite charging hazards. Don't expect communications breakdowns from that. There's the one year graph. The rel there are the relativistic electrons over the past three days, as measured using radiography by the GOES 16 and GOES 18. Kind of low levels here, an indication that there is a CME impact occurring. There's the one year graph and we've had extended period of low levels of electron flux, as you can see here at the end of the one year graph there from Solon.info. Here's the forecast model and check it out. NOAA expecting a big dip. Could indeed be. It depends on how strong of a CME impact it is. And I would tend to agree. It's just moving a little more slowly than expected. In fact, let's cut back and check. So the ACE is showing a continued minor uptick there. And the Discover, also a minor uptick there. So That CME, again, looks like it's moving a little more slowly than we anticipated. Next, the layer where the electron flux is measured. It's measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. It's located right about there at about 300 kilometers of altitude. Keep in mind, it does vary with day and night cycles and also with geomagnetic activity. Here are the vibrational frequencies. The ionosonde from the Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology. And as forecast yesterday, we're seeing a lot less high frequency anomalies and more low frequency anomalies. So, so far, this is a very weak solar coronal mass ejection impact. Fingers crossed for some action. Here's the anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. And again, you can see a lot more red showing up there. That depicts low-frequency anomalies. And here's the latest image. That's 1045 universal time for the ionosonde, or you could say ionogram. And there is... 1045 universal time for the anomaly gram. 
Here's the whole atmosphere model depicting total electron content and maximum usable frequency, along with the anomalies in those data. It's the global ionosphere now cast. I like it. It's I think it's our latest it's our latest addition to our daily space weather content. It gives you a great idea of the WAM, the whole atmosphere model. Great for radio operators and GPS users. Next, total electron content by itself. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with distances to the GPS satellite, for example. It's at about 12 and a half thousand miles of altitude, way up there in the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt, but only about half of the altitude of the GOES satellites. Here's your total electron content forecast. It's literally a count of free electrons through the ionosphere, inner plasmasphere, inner Van Allen belt, outer plasmasphere, and the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt. That's about where your GPS satellite is located. Those will be the most likely places to see GPS errors. And as we zoom in closer and closer to the US and approach our meteorology segment, we'll show the anomaly from the 10-day average for North America. So some significant high electron count anomalies there over Mexico. But besides that, looking pretty average, at least with respect to the 10-day average. Last section of the space weather video includes high-res imagery of the latest sunspot. So there you go. It is, it's trying to be beta gamma class. And what makes it beta gamma class is that there's not a straight north-south line connecting those umbrae. So right in here, if this was a straight north-south line, it would be beta class. It's barely beta gamma class because you see this little spot right here? That makes it beta gamma class, but barely. I'll say it's beta class. Again, also we've got a bunch of little pores here around the middle, or right around the solar equator there. And uh, not sure if those will amount to sunspots or not. This group up here, which should have been named days ago, still does have some tiny little umbrae there. And uh, yeah, we've got degradation of this sunspot group. So we may see just like a steady sunspot number here below 50. If you're spooked, if you're spooked of an inactive sun, it is definitely time for you to get into the bunker although you'll be coming out very shortly because we still aren't at solar maximum. <laughs> and, and, and uh, yeah, we're like over a year out from solar maximum. Solar cycles are extremely consistent, we think dating back to about 700 million years according to the fossil record. So the chances of a solar cycle being significantly shorter or longer than 11 years is shockingly low, shockingly low. And let's go wave chasing. I'm a wave chaser. What about you? The world's biggest waves right now are right there. Also, the world's highest winds, but they're not that high. The steez are the the the, the steez. You don't know my steez. The seas right now are pretty calm around the world. The stormiest section in the whole world is right there off the coast of Mexico. So that thing is gonna get caplastered though as it turns more northerly up into the Gulf of California. It's going to kind of go right up the Gulf of California for a minute, and it's going to break down real quick. So we'll show you a forecast here in a minute. Those are the world's largest waves and the highest winds, actually. So the Southern Ocean here, pretty calm. The North Atlantic here, pretty calm, although there are some great onshore winds there around Spain and France. So a little bit of wave action there. But yeah, the seas are pretty chill right now at the moment. Stormiest area 
and biggest waves and highest winds are right there off the coast of North America. And let's blast through the rest of our meteorology segment here, starting with surface winds of the eastern world. Shout out to our viewers from the east side. Here are the jet streams of the east side. Here are the jet streams of the central world. Shout out to our viewers from the central world. Here are your surface winds. Windy around the western Atlantic and eastern. I mean, I'm sorry. Windy around the eastern Mediterranean, the western Mediterranean and eastern Atlantic. Yeah, that's it. Shout out to our viewers from the west. These are the surface winds. And like sands through the hourglass of time, these are the jet streams of your lives. And here are the winds. Here's the wind map. Again, heavy winds there around places like Ireland, also Spain and France, seeing some heavy winds, but not as heavy as those winds. Still nearing hurricane force winds there. I suspect those probably are very close to hurricane force winds. Again, that thing is going to break down promptly. And here come some satellite images of the west. That is clouds and fog. And here's a close-up of that hurricane. It's already broken down since yesterday. There's no more eye wall. And it's probably not coming back. So I suspect this is a result of wind shear, as I can clearly see two different atmospheric systems there. I can see clouds at different altitudes. And I suspect wind shear is breaking up the upper, the upper level portion of those clouds. There's not a lot much else to explain that as the waters beneath it are quite warm indeed. The shallow, shallow hot water of the Gulf of California will keep that thing active, but I don't think, it's, I don't think the winds are going to pick up again. I think that thing is dying quick. Next year, weather.gov map. And we've got gale warnings there along the east coast of the U.S., also around parts of Hawaii, Alaska, seeing some blizzard warnings at the North Shore regions, and of course some tropical storm and hurricane warnings there around the west coast of Mexico. Also some small craft advisories there in the Gulf, and here come your forecasts. This is the GFS 72-hour pressure and precipitation forecast. And you can see how rapidly that hurricane it's, it looks like it's going to go over Baja, California, so that's going to do quite a bit of damage, striking a critical blow to that hurricane. The pressure still will remain low there, so there certainly is some convective power in that hot water in the Gulf of California. It will bring heavy rains to that coastal region of Mexico, as you can see on the map. So that's a 72-hour GFS pressure and precipitation forecast. Since we've got so many wind advisories, there is the GFS 72-hour mean sea level pressure and wind forecast. That's wind at 10 meters. You can see how quickly the rains are going to break down. I mean, the wind is going to break down on that hurricane. Right as it makes landfall on the continent, the winds are going to die down instantly. Heavy winds will make their way up the east coast of the U.S. And here's your jet stream map, the 250 millibar winds, same model, GFS 72 hour. And here is the temperature anomaly map. It's temperature anomaly in degrees Celsius, or if you prefer, centigrade. I don't know what the difference is, but yes, I'm one of those people who wishes we'd switch to the metric system and only use the metric system. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I like Fahrenheit degrees, but I also like kilometers, so I don't know. It's It seems like it's worth the 
anyway, whatever. Here's your lightning mapper. We did have some lightning across Kentucky and Tennessee, also into Georgia. Some minor thunderstorms there. The, the most lightning is currently happening around the Central American portion of the planet. Also the Bahamas. Actually, that is where the main lightning is. Pretty good number of lightning strikes here. 522 lightning strikes per minute at the moment. Also northern Italy there. Seeing some thunderstorm activity. We'll close this mother out with the latest Doppler radar. Clouds and fog. And there is the water vapor map, the jet stream there, moving that weather fairly consistently to the northeast. Here's your recap. Those are some slow movers right there, folks. There is, once again, clouds and fog depicted by 3.9 micrometer infrared radiation satellite. Part of the GOES NASA satellite suite. And there is the water vapor map. Looks like clear skies over most of Texas and Oklahoma at the moment. Anyway, thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network, least, bust, least busted name of news. Hopefully you're not too spooked of space. Space isn't scary. The sun and the galaxy are not going to kill you. However, you should still have a bunker because, because of human ignorance and stupidity. Remember, folks, never blame a conspiracy on that which is more easily attributable to ignorance and or stupidity. Anyway, we'll see you soon at the Smash News Network. Least busted name and news. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash O'Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind, incoming solar wind, be at your back.